continue on in our series, The Essential Church. The Essential Church. Matthew chapter 18. This is a theologically and doctrinally important passage, but it's also very practical. And every one of us in this room, to some degree, in some way, will have times when this passage of Scripture is important to us in its application. Matthew chapter 18, beginning verse number 15. <clears throat> scripture says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one, two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Father, we pray that I shall take the message today and speak to our hearts. Lord, thank you for that good song and good singing today. And Lord, we do have something to sing about. Thank you, Lord. Uh, let us look back to the day and set us free. And Lord, we pray that today you'd be honored and help us, Lord, uh, as we look at the scripture that we rightly divide it and rightly apply it to our lives now. Yes, we do pray for this officer's family. Lord, we pray that you'll be with them today and watch over them and the fellow officers today. We put them in your hands, Lord. We ask now that you'll uh, just guide and direct us now. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's an interesting passage of scripture here, very practical. In the Example that our Lord Jesus gives, he says, If thy brother shall trespass against thee, in other words, you have a uh, someone who has wronged you. They have done something harmful to you, hurtful to you. They have somehow have uh, uh, cheated you in some way. What do you do? How do you go about resolving this issue? Well, notice it says, Go and tell him, first of all, you do not run from conflict in life. You face conflict in life. When there's conflict, you go, he said, go and tell. Not run and hide. But go and tell. And don't say, well, I hope I don't run into Walmart. I'll get on that other aisle and tour around them. That's not resolving the issue. If thy brother has trespassed against thee, they have wronged you, go to them. So, well, if they want to resolve it, they come to me. That's not what the Bible says to do. The Bible says for that one who has been wronged to go and talk to them. The one who has been cheated is to go and seek to resolve the thing. And I notice what it says, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So we find here in verse 15, someone has wronged you, you they, they've mistreated you, they've cheated you, go to them privately. Uh, a good principle to remember here is that uh, keep the circle of knowledge as small as possible. Because uh, sometimes if we blow something up and everybody knows about it, it makes it harder for the person to ever get right about it. We want to make it easy for a person to heal and easy for them to deal with the conflict and move forward. All right? Notice here, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So you make the arrangement and say, I need to talk to you. I need to go and you talk to them. But yet, he says, if he shall hear thee, Thou hast gained thy brother. If you go to them and you try to talk to them and they say, oh, you're right, I messed up. I was wrong. I should not have done that. He said, when that happens, then you have gained your brother. You've now restored that relationship because you've gone to them and you've dealt with it and then you've gotten right with one another. Because many times when someone has wronged us, there may have been something that we did involving leading up to this that we didn't think about. And so the parties can't be resolved and get things taken care of. But thou hast gained thy brother. But, in verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, you go to them and say, look, hey, hey friend, you know, you, what you did was wrong. It could be like a, a, a man years ago had, uh, had somebody in the church co-signed for a loan for him, and he reneged on the loan. And the person who co-signed now stuck paying the loan. And, uh, and so there, there was conflict there. There was issues there. And so uh, he says, if you go to the person and they will not hear thee, they say, I'm not going to hear And you're just tough. And you just, that's just the way it is. He said, you're going to go to step two. 
You're not to just forget about it. You're not to just, well, you know, you know why? We're to help make each other better people. In a society, especially in a church society, I'm to be making you a better Christian, you're to be making me a better Christian. And by allowing things just to get swept under the carpet, allowing things to be done and nobody confront anybody about anything, but we're just all going to get along, but when you just get along, you don't get along. Things have to be dealt with. And so, uh, we find here, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee two, one or two more. He said, get two people, go with you. He said, look, I, I, went to, I went to my friend here about this, trying to resolve this thing. He, he just told me to go jump in a lake. And will you go with me and we'll sit down and try to talk to him. And, he, and the Bible says the reason for that is an Old Testament principle that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Uh, in Scripture, uh, when someone had a legal accusation against somebody, it was not even to be considered unless there were two or three witnesses. Because one witness could be misconstruing the whole situation. The one witness might be partially guilty and trying to cover. So two, three witnesses are very important. And even talks about in the New Testament when there's an accusation against a Christian leader. You can't even proceed. A church is not supposed to proceed against them without two or three witnesses. And here, because that's an Old Testament principle that's found throughout the Scriptures. And he says, so take two or three people with you. Go over there one, and, uh, go over, take some folks with you. And you sit down and say, friend, you know, I came over here and talked to you about this. And, and you told me to go fly a kite. And he said, I don't have a kite. And so I, so I came back over to see if we could resolve this. I want to get this thing resolved. I don't want there to be hard feelings between you and I. So, well, we, and so I asked them, my friends here to come on with me. They're not, we're not here to badge you. We just want to try to resolve this. And so you have witnesses of things that are being said and so forth. Uh, but he said, if he shall neglect to hear them. The guy said, well, I just have something to say concerning you and your friends there. You all can go out and jump on a lake. Well, I don't have a lake. <laughs> so i got to do something different. And so he may just tell you, just, I don't care what you think. I don't I, you know, I, don't, I just don't care. And so, listen, we're talking about God's people here. Now, in the world, that may seem normal, but amongst God's people, that's never be accepted as the norm. We're supposed to care. We should care. And so, uh, we don't, don't let it die there. He said, if he, that he shall neglect to hear them. Now, up to this point, whatever that man did to wrong you, the only people know about it is you and those two or three people you took with you. Nobody else knows about this. It's not to be on the phone with the gossip. Not to be everybody saying, well, but did you hear what he did to me? No. That, that gossip has no place in the life of the Christian. That's right. Well, there's no, and if the internet has done one thing, it has helped make gossip a uh, fad. Yeah, come on. Tell them what, did you know what she said? I don't know. What did she say? Oh, he said, did you know? And uh, back and forth. Listen, if lives get destroyed, if they're not there to defend themselves, don't say anything. Don't make accusations because people don't even have a, a way of defending themselves. And so, uh, but here, they've gone to the person, they've wronged you, and you've gone to the person by yourself, and you've gone with a couple other people that you have confidence in and sat down with them. But they say, I don't care. But then notice the next step, the third step, tell it unto the church. Tell it unto the church if he neglect to hear the church let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now, notice here, it said the next thing you do you take it to the church. You know, and I'm, this is not a message on church discipline, um, but there is that principle, and we probably have a message on it as we get into the proper procedure in church discipline. Uh, there are some pastors, they brag about how many people they kick out of the church every year and said how many people they reach. Right. And we're not talking about that sort of thing. But it does become necessary. First Corinthians talked about a situation where it became necessary. There was a man having a relationship with his stepmother. 
And so it required the church to act upon it. And we understand when the church acted upon the issue was not to try to condemn the person. It was to get restoration to the person. You want the person to resolve this so they can go on with their life and serve the Lord. And do it. It's not so that you can hang it over their head and, and say, well, and browbeat somebody with it. But you understand, if that person sells the church, he says, I don't care what the church says. I don't care what the people down at the church house say about that. And he says, if they do that, he said, you treat them just like they were heathen. Because that's what they're acting like. Because a Christian does care about what the church thinks. A Christian does care about church. church a Christian makes much of this institution. Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so we find here, uh, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now, I have a question for you. Very practical question. As we've been talking about the essential church, some have presented an idea that uh, it's not important that a Christian be identified with a local assembly where they serve God. A local, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, separated, soul-winning church. And they say, that's not important. I'm part of the universal church. The invisible church. They, and what they do, they mistake the usage of the word church in the Bible. Listen, if you're saved today, you're a member of the family of God. That's right. But that's not church. Jesus said upon his rock, I will build my church. This is an organism that Christ organized to conduct his business here on earth. It's church. It's not the same thing. Uh, there are a lot of saved people that are not associated with the church. That's a shame, but there are many other ways. We talk to people while we go on visitation. Somebody will pray and ask Christ in their heart. We've been working for years trying to get them to church. They always say, I'll be there Sunday. <laughs> you know, uh, if, if we look at the door, so, and they haven't got here yet. And then every time you see them, said, you're right, I know. And, but uh, they're struggling to get them to, to identify with church. Now, I want to challenge you if, with, a, with a question. If... The church he's talking about here is the universal, invisible body that's a mystical body, all the unsaved people in it. How do you tell it to the church? How would you practice this principle in Matthew? How are you going to do it? Uh, we're going to send an email to every person who's a Christian around the world, and we're going to present this. No, you take it for the church. A church is always a local, visible called out assembly, and uh, that's, it's, some people call it a Baptist distinctive, call it whatever you like, I think it's a Bible distinctive. It's a matter of a local church. Now, if, if it's talking about something other than a local church, how do you take it before church? How would you ever do that? And by the way, if church did not begin until the day of Pentecost, what were those disciples that he's teaching there? How would they ever practice that? Jesus established his church, okay? And. Uh, but notice here, we. I want to challenge you this idea of church membership today. Church is something that every Christian should be a member of. I have people say, well, there's no place in the Bible where it talks about church membership. I beg to differ with you. Church membership is taught in the Bible, and every Christian should be a member of a church. Now, let me ask you, if the person is not a member of the church, why would they care what the church said? I mean, somebody has never been to Ambassador Baptist Church, and one of our members goes and talks to them about a problem that they had, and it doesn't get resolved, and then we have a meeting here at the church about it, why would they care what our church said about it? I don't care. I don't go to that church anyway. That church don't have anything to say to me. I don't have anything to do with that church. So that it would have nothing to do with them unless it's talking about in the context people that are saved, that, is, that are part of a church, and they do care about what the church says about it, what a church says about the situation. And so, uh, church membership, and I'm going to give you several thoughts today from the Scriptures on this matter of the Bible teaches church membership. And let me challenge you today, if you are a Christian, the next step after you get born again, you need to get baptized. You need to follow the Lord and believe with baptism. And then, you need to identify with a Bible-believing church. You need to be a member of a... So, I, I attend their Easter and Christmas. That's not what I'm talking about. 
Uh, that's like, uh, you know, an arm. If, I, if, if, if this arm were to get severed and it's laying there on the table, it's not going to do my body much good, is it? It has to be connected to the body. And if you are a Christian and you're not connected to the body, you are of no good to the cause of Jesus Christ. You must be connected with the body because you are not all the organs of the body. You're not the hand, the feet, the head, and everything. You're just one small part. But when it's attached to the rest of the body, there's power, there's ability, there's a chance to get things done for the cause of Christ. Amen. Now, but, but, a, but a limb laying here on the floor does very little. It, remember there's some horror movie when I was growing up. I remember those old black and white movies that come on about midnight and I was a boy, forgive me, we watched them. The hand. <laughs> there was no body tech, it's just hand walking around. Ah! Kill people scream. It's the hand. You know? I, I, I always thought that was how the food just knock it down. You know? <laughs> There's that killer hand, knock it over. But you know how they had to dramatize it. I remember my uncle was sitting on the couch here watching one of those some nights, and the hand came out and grabbed somebody. He fell over the top of the couch along the wall. And here he was about 21 years old. He was back there behind the couch speaking over, you know. He reacted to the hand. Uh, now, but you and I were just one part. And we need to be connected with the body. Well, why should we join a church? The local church is the only place that has the authority to baptize converts. It's the only place that has authority to uh, distribute the Lord's Supper. It's the only organism that has the authority to ordain preachers and send missionaries. Not Bible colleges. Bible colleges should not be ordaining anybody. That local churches have that authority. It's the only place God tells the believer to go on the first day of the week. He didn't tell you to go to McDonald's on the first day of the week or Denny's on the first day of the week. But He does tell you to, that we are together at the house of God. We are together with, with the church on the first day of the week. On the Lord's Day. Uh, our daily lives and happiness depend upon our church membership. You show me a Christian who's not a member of a good Bible-believing church, and I'll show you a Christian who's struggling with joy, struggling with peace, struggling with any sense of any value in their Christian life. All saved people are members of the family of God, but one must become a member of a church. You become a member of the family of God by birth. That's how you got in your family by birth. But when it becomes a part of a church, they must join a church. It's your own will, your own volition, you join a church. Now, that's a New Testament pattern. Uh, there, we find that uh, we know in the New Testament there are people who were omitted from churches. And there are people received by churches. Uh, it's where God blesses you. It's the Agency for evangelism. Let me ask you this. When you read Matthew, when it talks about go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I have been, since I was a teenager, uh, right after I got saved, I remember a new pastor came, and my new pastor set me down with a little New Testament and marked out what we call the Romans Road to show somebody how to get saved and sent me out to witness. Now, I've been doing that now since I was about 16, 17 years of age. Okay? I have not been to all nations. Anybody here that's went and preached in every nation? You say, but I have taken the gospel to many of the nations of the world by through my church. Through a church. By the support of missionaries. Uh, by, by, we have, uh, did you know this last week? I was witnessing in Laos. You know how I did it? Our missionaries are there that we support, that are sharing the gospel. You see, uh, you cannot fulfill the Great Commission uh, by not being part of a church. You say, well, we, uh, you know, uh, I give to the United Way. Like I said, you cannot give the gospel to the world without being part of a church. Not, it's not the Elks, it's not the Mooses, it's not uh, the Eagles, it's not the Buzzards, it's the church. It's where we, we send out the gospel, and I cannot do it with that fulfill the Great Commission without my working, giving, supporting, and working through the church. It's impossible. By the way, that's why our missions uh, program here is done through our church. We don't send our money, put it off, we send it off to some world headquarters where they divvy out the money. Every missionary that we support that's on that bulletin board back there, that we support financially, you have had a chance to meet. 
They have been here. You've met them personally. They are accountable to us. And some of us have been to their field and we've seen what they're doing. And so it's, it's not just just pass out the loot and somebody go down to the Caribbean somewhere and go on vacation. You say, well, that would never happen. It does happen in some denominational missionaries. They're just on perpetually on vacation. We want to know if they've taken the gospel. And, uh, and we, we, we do that through the church. Now, we understand the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. And you know what it says to them? They were added to the church. How do you add to something? Notice there, 3,000 saved. It didn't say being saved added them to the church. They had them to be added to the church. 3,000 saved, 3,000 baptized. Then they were added to the church. But the thing that's interesting is all of them were. It is not scriptural for a person to get saved and not find a church. Somebody said, well, uh, we, we moved to... Well, you ever have a soul winning and talk to somebody and, and say, if you know, sure, if you died, then you go to heaven. Uh, yes, I got saved. And I'll tell you exactly where they trust in Christ. That's wonderful. And I said, and I said well, yeah, we're, uh, we're thinking about we haven't been to church for a while. We're looking for a church. And I said, oh, you just moved to the area yeah, this recently. Well, I said, well, uh, how long you lived here? Five years. Five years. The first Sunday you should have been looking for a church. Not, not five years, ten years. That means five to ten years was spent spinning your wheels. Find you a church. Now you say, preacher, you're talking about somebody here. I'm talking about a church. It may not be here. We may not be everybody's cup of tea. I understand that. We're a little funny around here. You know, you got pastors a little wacky, you know, and, uh, and all that sort of thing. I understand that. We may not be everybody's cup of tea, but find a church. Yeah. Get committed to it. Pour your heart into it. Reaching people through your church. Because through your church, you'll be able to do what you could never do on your own. As we work together as a team. <clears throat> we find uh, later in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 4, it talks about 5,000 people were saved. And you say, well, how is this done? It was done through their church. There wasn't just one person. Let me ask you this. Have you ever thought about it? There was 120 of them there on the day of Pentecost. And it says 3,000 people got saved. How many people do you have to lead to the Lord per minute to lead 3,000 people to Christ in one day? you got some busy soul with this. How, how much time would it take to baptize 3,000 converts? Have you ever calculated how many minutes would be required? And going through it, you know what? I tell you, one person, Peter didn't do all the baptized. Peter didn't do all the soul winning. It would be impossible. But you know what? 120 were doing it. 120 that were gathered in that upper room. Right? They were all involved. And then you could break it down and you could see how you could baptize 3,000 in one day. Now, and by the way, they didn't sprinkle them. They just give garden hose out and run under the garden hose in the name of Jesus. And that's not how they baptize them. They baptize them by immersion because that's what the word baptize means. 3,000 of them in one day. Uh, there have been a couple occasions in church history where that has been repeated. Only a couple times where 3,000 more converts were baptized in one day. And you know how they did it? They organized and they had several baptizing here, some baptizing here, until they got the job done. You know what? It took cooperation with Christians and part of a church to get it done. And so, we find them. There's spiritual correction. If, if we don't join a church, what can you get kicked out of if you're not a member of it? Ken, I've never attended the Moose Lodge. I don't know what they do there. I hope they eat moose sandwiches or something like that. That would be neat, you know. But I don't know what they do at the Moose Lodge. I have no idea. But if I got a letter of notification in the mail, you have been kicked out of the Moose Lodge. And I'm not criticizing the Moose Lodge. I'm saying I don't know anything about it. And I get this letter now. You have now, your membership has been rescinded and you kicked out. And I go, oh my goodness. How do I go on? I don't know how I'll get up tomorrow. And my baby kicked me out of the Moose Lodge. And, and I turned to my wife and said, what's the Moose Lodge? Now, I have to be a member to be kicked out, wouldn't I? So in the Bible, when people are removed and disciplined, what are they getting kicked out of if they're not part of a church? They didn't rescind their salvation. You can't say, oh, you're not saved anymore. We took it away from you. That church down here, church, we got a meeting the other night and said, we're going to send you to hell. You can't go to heaven. No church has that authority because the church can't save you or unsave you. 
And that's authority only Christ has. So you understand, uh, there has to be something that you can join and that you're on the road of for, you, for, for even so many of these verses to be understandable. Now, why do many believers not join the church? And I jotted out a few of the reasons. Some, because they are taught it's not important. How many times have we heard, well, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. And that is a true statement. You don't have to go to church to go to heaven. You really don't. Uh, but, it, but if you're going to get anybody else there, you probably aren't. You're going to have to be part of a team that's out trying to reach people for Christ. You're probably not going to... I, I've never met an effective soul winner that was not a church member. Never had it. I've never met somebody well, and that wins people to Christ and that identify with the church. Uh, then, uh, some will say, I don't, I'm not a church, I don't join the church because many groups emphasize the so called invisible church. Well, I'm part of the invisible church. And uh, as I've said before, that means they go to bedside Baptist. You know, on Sunday morning. Well, yeah, I was at bedside Baptist Sunday morning. I saw, and we had a wonderful, comforting sermon with Pastor Bella. Man, it just comforted me. Now, listen. Uh, <laughs> That is an unscriptural excuse. The invisible church. You can't, you can't join an invisible church and you can't be removed from an invisible church. You cannot be helped by an invisible church. Let me say this. I, I thank God that we're, we're on the internet and all that sort of thing. You know, many other days today. I didn't know you were out there on the internet. He was just listening to some of our services. I, and I appreciate you putting that together. But here's what scared me about a lot of this. There were people that stayed home and this church and watch it on the internet. Internet is not church. Internet, I'm for Christian radio. I'm given the Christian radio. We're on Christian radio. We've been involved with radio ministry for many years, which is not here locally, but we're for many years we've been on radio. Uh, but understand, if we listen to a Christian program on a Christian radio station is not church. You with me? Uh, somebody said, well, we got Christian television. Now, I don't know how much of that Christian television is Christian. Uh, I haven't watched it for many, many years. I got turned off to all that, you know, make with some gal standing with makeup she put on a paint roller, you know, and uh, she's standing there talking about how spiritual she's in. And I said, whatever she's got, I don't want. And uh, But you understand, I, it, it became so fake that I don't, I haven't listened to it anymore. Christian tell. I'm sure there's some good programs on there that are preaching. I'm sure there probably is, but I just not got involved with it for many years. But that's not church. Church is where you assembly literally, physically with God's people locally to conduct the work of the Great Commission and to reach folks for Christ and to serve the Lord. And it's, we find another why others don't believe and joining the church is it because they, they want to avoid the authority and discipline of the local church. I really think that might be more accurate many times. I, I don't want anybody to tell me how to live. May I say this to you? I need people to tell me how to live. Because I, I know what it is to live all wrong. I need it. I need somebody to take me to the Bible and say, the Bible says this is how you're supposed to live. And I have to be reminded of it over over and over. Maybe you're more spiritual than I am. Maybe you're up here and I'm down here. But I know what my flesh needs. It needs the preaching of the Word of God. And some don't want that. They don't want anybody telling them how to live or have any discipline over their life. And fourthly, why some people don't want to join a church because they want to escape the responsibility of a local church. And I believe that I'm not against large churches. I've been a member of large churches. I was a member of a church that had 12,000 in Sunday school. That's a large church. Yeah. In Highland Park Baptist Church down in Chattanooga, Tennessee years ago. I've been in large churches, but I think this mega church movement today has a lot to do with people who want to slip in and slip out and nobody even notice if you're there or not. I'm not against large churches, but I'm against that kind of large church. Uh, I, I'm so thankful. I, uh, I'll be going back down to Florida and preach at Landmark Baptist College. Uh, again in Florida back in, in December. Uh, that's a large church. I don't even know how many they run. That's a, the auditorium, when you say Joe, see 7,000. It's a big church. But, uh, but you know what? Every time I've ever been there and you get ready for the service, somebody will walk up to you and say, hey, well, it's good to see you. You, you must be busy. They don't, they'll recognize that you're not from there. 
It's a large church, but it's not where you slip in and slip out. They know if you're a visitor or not. Every time I've ever been there, somebody approached it, it's good to have you visit with us. How do you know it's a visitor? Do I have a big sign on my head that said visitor? How did you know? But you understand, a large church doesn't have to be one like these mega churches where you just slip out and you've got, you got religious entertainment on the platform where everybody just sways and sings some, some uh, little ditty that means nothing and says nothing, has no effect over your life. And so well, I went to church. You didn't go to church. You went to a nightclub with, with a cross on the front of the building. That's all that was. Church. We go there because we want to have accountability. We go there because we want to. Uh, as iron sharpens iron, we want to sharpen the countenance of our friends. I need you to help make me a better Christian. You need me to help make you a better Christian. We need each other. But they don't see that. They don't want that accountability. So, as we think about this, what evidence do we have of church membership in the Bible? Several indicators. Look at them very quickly. Several indicators. Um, had stated memberships. It's possible for churches to have a definite number of members without having a written list of them. It appears that they did have a written list in the Bible. How would you keep track of 3,000 members you got in one day? You got a pretty good memory, don't you? How would they know what widows were being neglected when they established the first deacons to take groceries if they didn't know what widows were even associated with their church? If there's not a record. You understand, there has got to be a record <coughs> and, uh, for things to get done. Uh, and so, uh, let me say this today, when, when a person, and this is more local for, you, for us right here, when a person joins in Ambassador Baptist Church, we have a, co we have a covenant, and we may not always say this, but this, that's what it means when somebody comes, I'd like to join Ambassador Baptist Church. Our church covenant this is a legal document. It states what a person means by that. It says in, in, in our Constitution, a legal document, this is having been led by the Holy Spirit to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. Probably good if we read this every time somebody came from membership. What's, what's it mean on coming to membership? It goes on to say, We engage therefore by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to assist in its religious, charitable, and educational purposes, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of its ministry, the expenses of the church, to the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions to educate our children in the Word of God, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, uh, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, fleshly lusts that war against the soul, and excessive anger, <coughs> To abstain from the sale of and use of intoxicating drinks, tobacco, and narcotic drugs. Not being brought into bondage by the habits of the world. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love. To remember one another in prayer. To aid one another in sickness and distress. To cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and in Christian courtesy of speech. To be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We further promise to unite with another church as soon as possible where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word should we be moved from this place. That's what a person is saying when they come to say, I want to join Ambassador Baptist. Maybe not the only words, but that's what they're saying. That's summarizing it. I guess summarize is stretching it out rather than summarizing it. But it's explaining what that means. And there are three ways a Christian joins a church. Number one, they can join a church by baptism. The person's not saved. They've never trusted uh, Christ as Savior. And they now get saved and then follow the Lord and believers' baptism. And they are united with the church by their baptism unless they request not to be. They, uh, for example, would be like somebody like the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, 
He's not, he doesn't, he's down, he's going back down to Ethiopia. He would not unite with the church out in the middle of the desert there. When he got saved, he got baptized, and Philip baptized him. And so uh, he would, uh, he would go on down. But uh, normally a person gets baptized, just like the day of Pentecost, 3,000 saved, 3,000 baptized, 3,000 added to the church. The second way a person joins a church is by transfer. For example, if somebody has already been saved and baptized and a member of another church somewhere else in the world, and they come to Frederick area and they're now here, they can transfer membership. And that can be done uh, usually with a letter of recommendation from their former church. That letter is sent saying they're in good standing with our church and they've chosen to be. And really without much to do, they become a member of the church here. That membership can be transferred from another good church, all right? Uh, every once in a while I get, we get these letters of somebody we've never even seen before. They're, this person wanted to transfer their membership and we have to say, I don't know who they are. I think maybe they came once 40 years ago or something like that. But uh, transfer membership is the second way you can join a church. First of all, baptism. Number two, transfer. There is a third way a person uh, can join the church. Uh, one, if somebody has been saved, they have been baptized, but they, they neglected membership with the church. They may have said, well, we don't want to join the church right now. Or maybe they moved away and they've been back here for a while, but they didn't just move here. Uh, so there's no, they don't have a church that's going to recommend them as a faithful member there. But they can if they're uh, by, by simply extending to what we call the right hand of fellowship. Somebody has been saved, baptized, but they're not a member of a church right now, and they choose to be a member, then we'd have them come, and the church would vote right there how many rejoice that this person has come to be a member of Ambassador Baptist Church, and we would extend the right hand of fellowship, and folks would go by and welcome them to the membership of the church. Now, there's three different ways a person can join a church. Now, getting out is much harder. Yeah. Okay? It's easy to join, but we don't want anybody to get out. We're not, we're not trying to Boot people out of the church. Right. Now, can a person be removed? And we'll have a message on that. We'll talk about yes, they can. But that's never the goal. The goal is restoration. Remember, someone has committed a trespass. We want to go to them and resolve issues. We don't want their issues to resolve uh, some way where just where people have to be disciplined from a church. Uh, and I, you know, in my ministry, we've only ever had to do that one time. A person was loaded out of the membership and removed. Uh, and, and so I do believe it should be done at times, and uh, but it's not something that you look forward to. It's something the church ought to enter into with fear and trembling. And someone has to be removed from the church membership. But we understand. Now, let me, let me pull this together. This matter of church membership. New Testament speaks of several different situations that if there is no church membership, they would make no sense. What were the new converts added to in Acts 2.47 if there was no church, local church membership? How did they know the number of their converts if there was no written record of membership? Whose widows did they take care of in Acts chapter 6? You see, they had to make a decision were they widows indeed. Some widows they didn't take care of. How did they know that was a record of who those widows were? From what did they choose the first deacons from in Acts chapter 6? How could Paul tell the church at Corinth to expel a sinning brother if he's not a member? How do you expel someone who's not a member? What would he be expelled from? Who did Paul write to at Rome, Corinth, Philippi, Colossae, and Ephesus when he said, I write to the church at Philippi, the church at Rome, the church. He didn't write to every believer that may have lived there. He wrote to the church. That's right. Some of them were meeting in homes and so forth. Who did Christ write to in Revelation chapter 2, verse 3? If there's no such thing as a local church and church membership, when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, when he wrote to the church of Smyrna, when he wrote to the church of Sardis, when he wrote to the church of Philadelphia, when he wrote to the church of Laodicea, to whom was he writing? If there's no membership. Was it just whoever the crowd happened to be that day when the letter arrived? Who were the elders over in Acts chapter 14, verse 23? Who sent
sent Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And who did Paul and Barnabas assemble with in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, when it says he met, they met with the church? The church. This is serious business, and I know it's downplayed in our day. The truth is, we're out of step with this whole world. We just out of step with this whole world in every way. And the fact is, we're becoming more and more out of step with Christendom with what's called Christianity in our day, we're getting more and more out of step. Because there's an abandonment, abandonment of the Bible to draw these lines and make these definitions. We do what we want to do, however we want to do it, and how our religious authority is not amazing so much. So when our church doesn't teach this, our denomination, this is what determines what our church teaches. Amen. Right here. Not Pastor Fry. Not... The deacons don't sit around and say, well, this is what our church believes and preaches, and this is what you ought to preach next Sunday. Huh. Our deacons want me to preach the Bible each week. And you know, this is, this is our authority. This Bible is our church's marching orders. We're to march by it, not, another, not the beat of a different drum. The church. Let me, let me say this today. Everybody right here, let me challenge you. If you are not a member of a good, fundamental, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church today, I want you to pray about being a part of the ambassador of this church. If you've been saved and you've been baptized, I want you to pray about it. I said pray about it. God may not want you here. If He doesn't want you here, please don't be here. He <laughs> said, oh, you mean what? Yes. Because if you're here, you're not where you're supposed to be. I want you where you're supposed to be. You know, the last thing we need is a bunch of backslidden Christians in the church and we're all fussing and fighting each other and none of us in the will of God. I want you to pray about if you're saved and you've been baptized, you've been a part of it. You've joined the Ambassador Baptist Church and serve the Lord right here. If you are, if you're planning on moving or if you do move someday, will you plan on joining the church within a few weeks after you make that move? Their people won't join a church for a year. Now, I know they're probably in any community you move to, there's only going to be three or four churches that are going to be halfway decent anyway. And you can visit them within a month, every one of them. And so there's no reason for you to not join a church for weeks and months and years. Will you plan on, by the way, we're supposed to bring our tithe the first day of the week. Where are you going to bring your tithe if you don't even know where you're going to go to church yet? You need to know quickly when you get into a community where you're going to serve the Lord. And, uh, and, and dig in there. Be faithful there. I, I, talk, I know college kids. They go off to college and they think, well, I'm in college. I don't have to go to church now. You go to church on Sunday. When you're in another city, when you're traveling. When I'm traveling, I don't travel much on Sunday. I've missed, what, I think five? I've been here how many years? Maybe five Sundays? I don't even know if I missed five that way. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I missed five. And, and maybe four. Maybe four. I don't know. It's been very few. But if I'm not here, if I'm traveling, and it's church time, I'm in church. Right. I plan my travel around it. I know evangelists that don't go to church. Except when they're in a meeting, they're doing preaching. Listen, church is vital and important to your life. Being church. And it's not that hard to find out what church. All you have to do is find out the church that says, Do you believe the Bible? This one, by the way, the King James Bible. Do you believe every word in that Bible is true? You have just eliminated most of the churches. You've just about eliminated all of them. Probably 99 points. So, well, we believe it contains the truth, but there's some error in there too. You don't have the Bible I've got. That'll, that'll settle in most communities real quickly what church you're going to go to. Most of them don't believe that. They'll say, well, it's, it's got a lot of man mixed in there. Then throw that Bible away and get you a real Bible. That doesn't have any man in there. That's God's Word. Settle it. Uh, they teach that you're going to lose your salvation. Yeah. Uh, Mark you off the list. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I got eternal life. Come on. Amen. But they, and you'll be surprised. Most of the churches right here in this community will tell you you get saved you can lose it. You can't lose it. And that's usually some of the bigger ones. I don't know why it's so, but you can't lose your salvation. Eternal means eternal. 
glory. You're born into the family of God. Listen, I, I, I may have some falling outs with my parents, but I, they were still my parents. And you can have some falling out with God, but He's still your God. If you've been born in this family. But that doesn't make me a member of the church. Make much of church. Be here. Learn to be faithful. If you've got a job that takes you out of church, start praying for another job. It may be years before you're able to get another job, but at least you're trying to be faithful to church. And when, you, when there are revival meetings, you know that's church time. When there's special meetings, revivals. Listen, I, I would see we'll have these things with the kids and nobody shows up. I always say, well, why doesn't everybody come out? Because you care about the kids. Even so, I'm not a kid. But yeah, but you care about them, don't you? Now when we have a death activity, well, the whole church ought to show up for the death activity. We ought to be behind them. Not, well, I don't want the death ministry. Now, I know you have to live. You can't be everywhere. You can't do everything. But we can do a whole lot more than we do in supporting the work of God. Make much of your church. Make much. And, I, and I'll close with this. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Some of the wickedest scoundrels I've ever met in my life. Evil people I've met at church. But some of the sweetest, godliest, kindest, generous people I've ever met on God's earth I met at church. Don't let the not head spoil it. There's something wonderful that takes place in God's churches. It's wonderful. I love it. That's one of the things I got excited when God called me to preach. I mean, I get to go to church all the time. Wow! I hear me say, are oh, we going to have revival? How many nights do you expect us to come to church? All of them. Because you need it. I know how wicked you are. No. <laughs> and I need it too. And you know how wicked I am. Father, please take the message today. Lord, help us to make much of this institution. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We understand that's not a denomination. That's not a hierarchy. That is a local assembly of believers who are united together to fulfill the Great Commission together. They've covenanted together to, to worship and to pray and to study your word and to grow in grace together. Help us, Lord, to make much of this institution, this organization, this organism called the church.